Yeah. All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, we're a webcast, we're an online show, uh, whatever you want to call us. <laughs> um, we're here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, the shows are recorded, however, if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website that I'll show you at the end of the show and see our archives of all of our shows going back to the beginning. We started in 2009. We have everything on our website. Uh, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, mini training sessions, uh, um, interviews, demos, um, book reviews, uh, basically anything library related, we are happy to have it on the show. We do bring in guest speakers sometimes, and sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff um, on the show. And that is what we have today. We have actually one of our guess, regular sessions, yeah. yeah, our annual summer reading program session <laughs> with um, Sally Snyder, who is next to me here, who is our um, children and coordinator of children and young adult library services at the Nebraska Library Commission. And every year, before the summer reading program starts up, she comes on and gives us um, a nice big presentation of lots of titles that you can use in your summer reading program. And I'll give you a warning, this is for the people who are live, and I mentioned this before we start recording, but also for anyone watching the recording, this is an episode that does tend to run long. Um, so if you are watching this in the recording, um, yes, typically our show is an hour-long show, but there is a very good chance that this one will run longer. We'll just go as long as it takes to get through Sally's entire list, um, just so that you're aware that this will potentially not be just our hour. So, um, I think that's it. We're good to go. I can hand over to you, Sally. Take it away. Thank you. The faster I talk, the more books I add to my list. <laughs> Before we get started on the list, I want to go to this one. Yes, yes. I just want to show you, here's the Library Commission's main homepage. When you go to it, this is what you see. And up in the corner, there is a search box. So if you search handouts, a list hopefully will come up. Okay. Yeah, hit the button there. Nebraska Library Commission handouts. And, whoops. And there's this list. And I have been talking about archiving some of these older ones like Beth Youth, Youth Books of 2008. We may not need that on there anymore. <laughs> so if a few at the bottom disappear, we do still have them somewhere. So if you do for some reason need something that's disappeared, please email me and I can get it to you. But the reason I wanted to show you this is because this has, so far I'm the only one using this space. I'm the one that asked for it. I tell people, you can use it too, but they have other ways of doing things, and that's fine. So today, the list of books that I'll talk about is right here. There's a, uh, there it is, a PDF form, that so you can look through and see the author, title, information, including the cost, and the ISBN, which I hope you find helpful. So if you don't happen to have that in your hand right now, and you really want that as you listen, Go ahead and get started on that, and I will start talking here in a minute, but um, I'm sure you can catch up, right? Let's just reduce that down enough. It just minimize that one. There we go. Okay, okay there. Perfect. So, I pull out books that are, at the time that I first start compiling this, generally they're newer books. They may have been too new to get on the Collaborative Summer Library Programs list that comes mm -hmm. with the manual, or some of them might be on that list. So. These are ones that I've encountered. Um, a number of publishers send me review books every year, and I do seek out other titles from other publishers to try and be inclusive. And if I've missed your favorite book, I'm so sorry. I just probably didn't run into it, or I ran out of time to read it. Mm -hmm. So, And so I will be reading from a list, my blurb list, because I learned that if I don't stick to the script, we will be here till 3 o'clock. <laughs> Everybody else will have left by then, I'm sure, but I have to just... Some people may enjoy talking all day about children's books, but yes. yes. And so we'll start with fiction picture books. Um, Howard P. Wigglebottom Learns About Courage by Howard Binkow and Reverend Anna. Howard is afraid of almost everything, so he decides to stay in his room. A young bird outside his window is flying for the first time, and he tells Howard that, if you're not afraid... You can't be brave. Howard decides to try being brave, and it works. 
it's didactic, but it will be helpful for children who are in that situation. Whoosh and Chug by Sebastian Braun. Chug is an engine that works with heavy freight. He might be slow, but he is very careful. Whoosh calls Chug slowpoke and later in the day zooms right past him. But Whoosh didn't notice the red track light that meant danger ahead and he became trapped between the hole in the bridge ahead and the rock slide that came behind him. And what hard-working engine cleared the rocks? You guessed it. This is a simple, good story for toddler time with Whoosh thanking Chug on the last page. The Troublemaker by Lauren Castillo. A bored boy grabs his younger sister's toy bunny and sends it out to sea, prisoner of pirates. His mom is not happy with him. But after he returns the bunny, it goes missing again. And soon his toy raccoon and other things begin to disappear. Something is up. It isn't until the next morning the boy discovers what has been going on. See that real raccoon there in the back behind the tomatoes? No, yes. He's the culprit. He's been snitching um. everything. <laughs> his empathy then that night, missing his raccoon and realizing that his sister must have felt the same way about her bunny, is a nice touch. Now, you can't have good guys and heroes if you don't have bad guys, right? So <laughs> Shifty McGifty and Slippery Slam by Tracy Corduroy is a, a story about some bad guys. Look at those. They have the, the typical white and black striped shirts on. You know they're bad. And masks. And masks. <laughs> this rhyming text tells of two dogs who plan a tea party for their friends, and then they're going to rob them while all their friends are at the party. One dog overhears their plan, and all the partygoers follow the thieves, confront them, and then offer a solution for their careers. Open a cafe. They're so good at baking. So, yes, they're not going to be bad guys anymore, but it's great fun to watch them be slippery and slinky around the town. Motor Dog by Kurt Cyrus. A boy, Flip, or orders Motor Dog, the perfect pet, over the Internet. Everything is great until Motor Dog's box scoop the cat. A dog is a dog after all. When Motor Dog abandons the chase to save Flip from a bad fall, Flip decides a dog with no extra features is just fine and names him Buddy. And he tosses aside the contraption that you can see him wearing, the, mm, the vest rockets. with the rockets and things on it. Um, the final illustration is hilarious because the cat has found the contraption. <laughs> <laughs> Companionship, caring for others, and the deviousness of cats, what, <laughs> are included. Because I have cats. Dinosaur Rescue by Penny Dale. A dinosaur train is moving down the tracks, but the engineer doesn't know a truck up ahead is stuck on the tracks. Call Dinosaur Rescue. Can they save the day? The front end papers have ten dinosaurs identified on them, and the back end papers have seven vehicles identified. This is sure to be popular with dinosaurs and rescue vehicles. How can you go wrong? Mm -hmm. Super Red Riding Hood by Claudia Davila. Ruby's favorite color is red, and when she puts on her red cape, she is Super Red Riding Hood. When her mother sends her out to pick some raspberries, she knows there is danger in the woods. And at first, when a wolf appears, she is a little afraid, but she uses her dodging skills to evade him. And it turns out that he's hungry, and Ruby shares the raspberries with him. Small Blue and the Deep Dark Night by John Davis. Small Blue wakes up and is frightened of all the potential bad things that are waiting for him in the dark, like goblins or clacky skeletons. Big Brown tells her, instead of goblins, isn't it just as likely to be a delightful doggy Saturday night unicycle convention? Or another harmless thing, unexpected. Sure. And then, then the thought that it's so dark you don't know what's there, well, why think of some, something scary when it could be something silly and fun? Small Blue takes the lesson to heart, and I think listeners will do that too. Get Ready, Weasels by Ellis Dolan. They actually spend each day plotting world domination. <laughs> The evidence is right here in this book, and as it says on the cover, megalomania has never been so furry. <laughs> they have machinery and plenty of coffee. What could possibly oh, no. stop them? <laughs> yes, and, and you flip the all the pages look like this. There's different levels, people pushing buttons and, and turning dials and 
and reading screens. It's, it's great silliness. Silly and clever illustrations convey the extent to which the weasels have apparently gone. And readers will really enjoy looking closely at their antics and will love the fact that their big plan isn't going to work because something's not plugged in. Uh -uh. Or... It's always something. Yeah. <laughs> Superworm by Julia Donaldson. Rhyming text tells of the many things Superworm does to help spend time with his friends. His friends are shocked when the wizard lizard sends his servant crow to bring Superworm to him. The insects and other animals concoct an amazing plan. They hope to save Superworm. Mm -hmm. Now another Red Riding Hood, this is Little Roja Riding Hood by Susan Middleton Elvia. When the wolf tricks Roja into picking some flowers for her grandma, he sneaks off with a red cape to visit grandma. Can grandma and Roja save a, face a wolf and save the day? The sprinkling of Spanish words are understood within the context of the story. And the author has included a pronunciation guide and a translation of each in the front of the book. Watch these pages for the three blind mice and a couple of tiny troublemakers, trickster elves. <laughs> oh yes, and this was a Pearl Bell Prey Illustrator Honor Book for 2015. And good for stories. Oops, thank you, sir. When You Wander by, by Margarita Engel is a gentle look at search and rescue dogs who tell, this dog tells the young child what the dog can smell in the air and on the ground and what the child should do if he or she gets lost. <clears throat> the dog running toward you with the bright orange sniffing school vest is happy to have found you, not running at you to bite you. The illustrations convey the non-threatening dog in a very positive light. This is good information with some facts for kids and parents at the back of the book, and useful information for parents to share with their children. The Almost Fearless Hamilton Squidlager by Timothy Basil Aaron. Brave by day, wielding swords and attacking fire-breathing frackensnapper or a dangerous brackelsneed, Hamilton scares easily at night. He takes refuge in his parents' bed. With the promise of a grasshopper worm cake to eat in the morning, and the recommendation to remember that monsters visit because they want to play, Hamilton tries to stay in his own mud that night. And what an adventure he has. It's silly and humorous with great made-up words. This is full of fun. Catnapped by Lisa Hernandez. A curious cat curls up in a chair on the back of a pickup truck and is accidentally taken away from home. Fortunately, a girl rescues her and takes her to the pound where the owners find her. Rhyming text with two two-word sentences, then a five- or six-word sentence, like found cat, surround cat, taken to the pound cat. <laughs> oh, yes. I hope you're all already very familiar with John Himmelman's books. This is the first one, Chickens to the Rescue. Whenever things go wrong or extra help is needed, the chickens are there to take care of it. Though they look scattered, disorganized, and frantic, they are good help. The clever ending will bring smiles and chuckles and a request for the other three books. Watch out in each title the last page or casts who will help next. And I really want to invite the chickens to my office because I think they could really help me there. Mm -hmm. I'm not as interested in having pigs to the rescue come to my office. This is also by John Himmelman. While the chickens in the first, first book were quite help, helpful, the pigs in this sequel are overly helpful. Things might be better if they didn't get involved. Keep an eye on the little, littlest pig. He stands out in his own way. See him there on the cover. Then there's cows to the rescue. It's county fair day, but the truck won't start. Cows to the rescue. The cows step in several times and really help the family at the fair. Keep an eye on the young calf and the littlest pig. It continues the fun of the earliest books. And the last one that I'm aware of is duck to the rescue. Ernie the Duck desperately wants his turn to jump in and save the day when help is needed. He keeps trying to help, but each time it results in disaster. The little lamb finds a way for Ernie to be successful, and the final illustration is a winner. And please keep Ernie out of my office. Just send the chickens if you see them. Firefighter Hippo by Jonathan London. Little Hippo puts on his helmet ready to fight fires, but his fire truck keeps getting stuck. 
in the mud wallow or in the tall grass, and each time he needs help to get it out. Then lightning hits a tree and starts a fire in its branches. Will little hippo be able to save the day? A pattern of encountering different animals and needing help from them allows prediction guesses from the listeners. It's good for story time. Bunny the Brave War Horse by Elizabeth, Elizabeth McLeod. This is a picture book for older readers, say grades one to two, I mean one to three or four. It tells of World War I. Bunny, so named for his longer than average years, was a brave police horse, so he is one of the 18 horses and four officers of the Mounted Police in Canada selected for the 9th Battery Canadian Field Artillery. Bunny was ridden first by Bud, and then after Bud was killed by his brother Tom. They faced gas attacks, artillery shelling, and lack of food, among other things. This fictional book is based on a real story. Additional facts are included at the back of the book. And because that's it's about nice, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that's why they say it's mm -hmm. a slightly older mm -hmm. age group. I'm Brave by Kate and Jim McMullen. A fire truck is ready to go and talks with the reader, showing all his tools and equipment ready for an emergency. When the word comes that a house is on fire, he is off. We see how he gets to and fights the fire with hoses and tools and plenty of exclamation points. <laughs> sure to be a popular title for the summer. I think if you set that one out, it will be gone in, in three seconds. Bravo Chico Conta Bravo by Pat, and Libby, Pat Mora and Libby Martinez. The youngest in the family with 12 mice children, Chico is always off doing something. The mice family watches a play of the three little pigs and then recreates the production for their insect and mice friends. It is at the performance that Chico, playing the sun, sees danger before anyone else does. Mrs. Conto, Chico's mother, greatly values those who are bilingual, and that is what saves the day. And just so you know, Libby Martinez is Pat Morris' daughter. Superhero and the Barber of Doom by John Rockman. Rocco realizes his superpowers are becoming stronger as his hair grows longer. His three friends are experiencing it too. They are doing everyday things like jumping rocks across a creek and jumping obstacles using their skateboards. Then one day Rocco is taken to the barber and he could barely manage to wake his, make his way back to headquarters. There he finds his friends have also had head haircuts and they all feel doomed. Can they muster any strength? A little girl in the neighborhood finds a way to help them get out of their slump and discover that they really can still be heroes. The artwork enhances the story and is a great feeling of empowerment for the listeners. Big Bad Bubble by Adam Rubin. You may not know this, but when a bubble pops in our world, it disappears from here, but it reforms in a land where monsters live. They are very afraid of bubbles. Finally, one day, a monster pops a bubble and finds it isn't dangerous at all. What a relief! But watch out for butterflies. Those Children, yes. oh yes. <laughs> Children will love the idea that scary monsters are so afraid of such a little thing. Super Truck by Stephen Savage. Most of the time, he is a mild-mannered garbage truck wearing glasses. But when a huge blizzard stops the city, he becomes Super Truck. <laughs> Plowing the streets clear and digging out the city. The next day, no truck knows who or where he is. He's back collecting garbage with his glasses on. Mm -hmm. Larry Gets Lost in Alaska by John Skews and Michael Mullen. Apparently, Larry gets lost lots of places, and lots of you out there are probably familiar with Larry mm -hmm. already. Larry needs a nap. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Here, Larry and his human family are touring Alaska from a ship. As they prepare to board a plane to visit other parts of Alaska, Larry follows a tasty smell and ends up in the wrong plane. When the plane lands, he jumps off and begins to explore while looking for his boy Pete. After a number of adventures, Larry is found in a dog sled. The owner rescues him and calls the number on his tag. It includes the, some nonfiction information about Alaska on almost every two-page spread. Listeners will certainly want it, more books about Larry. I found 16 titles so far, but Larry hasn't visited Nebraska yet that I could find. Red Knit Cat Girl to the Rescue by Nakoa, Naoa Stoop. Nakoa Stoop. Sorry, that's, that's harder than I thought. 
Redneck cat girl and her forest friends are playing with newspaper when they find a lost polar bear cub floating on a piece of ice. They learn from the moon that they must take the cub way up north to rejoin his mother. They make a boat from newspaper and red knit cap girl and the bunny go with the cub. This is a gentle story with soothing illustrations even when they encounter a storm. A good story time choice and listeners will be pleased with a joyful reunion and not a one of them will wonder how they ever got anywhere in a newspaper book. That's what adults <laughs> think. Like, I have to remind myself. Naughty Kitty by Adam Storr. A little girl gets a new kitten instead of a puppy, but he is very naughty. Listeners and readers will see the very naughty one, a tiger, escape from the zoo. But the girl is amazed at the huge messes this kitten makes. When the kitten, really the tiger, scares away the neighbor's dog, the girl proclaims, Kitty, you saved me! And all is forgiven. There are more antics from the zoo that are noted on the final pages and the end papers of the book. So if you include that when you're reading the story, the kids will love it. Let's sing a lullaby with the Brave Cowboy by Jan Thomas. This is so fun. Each time the cowboy begins to sing to his two cows, he is frightened by something ordinary, like a flower or a stick. Kids will love each huge eek he shouts as the cows are getting droopy-eyed and sleepy. But when the cowboy sees a huge shaggy gray wolf and waits for the cows to tell him what it really is, they are scared and they yell, eek! No worries, the wolf just wants to snuggle up and hear the lullaby. Some prediction with this, each shape, what is each shape that he sees and what does the wolf really want? It's clever fun and be ready for lots of loud, loud eeks from the kids when you read it. Some picture book nonfiction titles. One is Have Courage by Sherry J. Miners. This is from the Being the Best Me series. A boy describes different ways he can be brave every day, mostly in small ways, including sometimes saying no to classmates. It includes a four-page section for parents at the back of the book, giving suggestions on ways to reinforce the ideas. Tuesday Tucks Me In by Luis Carlos Montalban and Fred Quitter. Luis returned after being wounded in Iraq. Tuesday is his service dog that helps him with his balance, his nightmares, flashbacks, and even reminds him to take his medicine. This is a reassuring look at the effects of war on a person and the service dog who performs his duties with love. This is one of my favorite books of this batch I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Beginning mm -hmm. readers and early chapter books, for those of you who don't know, I used to separate out beginning readers, but then early chapter books kind of, everything's blending together. I can't mm -hmm. determine a lot. So, I just blended them all together, too, so you decide what, what it's what. Well, we all know that Lesboy and Fly Guy is a beginning reader. This is by Ted Arnold. This is Fly Guy number nine. In this, Buzz has written a comic book, and he reads it to Fly Guy. In it, the superheroes, Buzz Boy and Fly Guy, awaken to find their house have been moved by pirates to a dragon cave on a faraway island. Can they overcome this situation? The clincher at the end, Buzz asks, want to read it again? And Fly Guy says, Yes. <laughs> then we also have Fly Guy Presents Firefighters, also by Ted Arnold. This is primarily nonfiction, but Fly Guy and Buzz visit a fire station and learn about equipment, the knowledge and skills firefighters have and use. The illustrations are like this cover, photos with an overlays of Fly Guy and or Buzz. It includes a list of safety tips for children at the back of the book. Similar nonfiction titles in the Fly Guy series are about dinosaurs, sharks, and skates, but this one's popular. You might expand into the others. The Princess in Black by Shannon Hale and Dale Hill. Princess Magnolia is exceedingly proper when Duchess Wigtower visits. She was not invited. <laughs> Unfortunately, the castle is quite close to Monsterland, and an emergency arises. Magnolia must become the princess in black and save the day with some help from a horse. Meanwhile, the duchess is snooping around her castle looking for secrets. I think there'll be more books. This is the first one. I expect more in this series. Captain Awesome to the Rescue by Stan Kirby. This is book one in this paperback series. Eugene, he is eight and he's in second grade, has just moved to a new town. He loves comic books 
especially Super Dude, and Eugene has created his own costume to make himself Captain Awesome. He makes a new friend at school, Charlie Thomas Jones, and soon Captain Awesome is on the job solving the disappearance of the class pet, Hamster Turtle. In this series, the superheroes, soon there will be three, solve everyday problems and issues through their imaginative superpowers. Captain Awesome vs. Nacho Cheese Man by Stan Kirby is both book two in this series, and Nacho Cheese Man is um, Eugene's best friend, Charlie. But they have a dis disagreement and a, and a misunderstanding when Eugene's newest Super Dude comic is missing. He blames Charlie, and so you can see they're against each other. Nacho Cheese Man always has a can of squirting cheese on hand as his weapon mm -hmm. for justice. <laughs> In book three, Sally Williams, a.k.a. Supersonic Sal, will join the Sunny, Sunny View Superhero Squad. And a little later on, uh, book 11 is Captain Awesome versus the evil babysitter, where Eugene is not allowed to leave the property while the babysitter is in charge. How can he meet Charlie and Sally now? All his plans for a great weekend are ruined. And you can see Turbo, the class hamster, he's actually mm -hmm. a super pet. In that Quote, yet. yeah. Quote super pet. Mm -hmm. Another favorite of mine is the series by Cindy Marco. It's... The series is called Kung Pao Chicken, and the first book is called Let's Get Cracking. Gordon is second grade, and his younger brother, who's still in the eggshell, then he ac they both accidentally fell into a vat of toxic sludge at their Uncle Quack's laboratory. Now Gordon is discovering his new superpowers. His tail feathers tingle when danger is near. He has an extraordinarily loud squawk, and he can create a large wind with his wings. Someone is selling glowing cookies that make the citizen's feathers fall out. Kung Pao Chicken is on the case with his sidekick, Egg Drop, who's his younger brother, Benny. The catchphrase is, let's get cracking. Very silly. <clears throat> Book two is Bok Bok Boom. There are some tough sides about being a superhero. Gordon has to wash his super suit when his mom isn't looking, and he has a pinchy leotard. Now his mom is making Gordon and Benny join her to hear the world-famous opera singer Honeycomb. When Honeycomb is kidnapped during her performance, Kung Pao Chicken and Egg Drop are on the case. The Birdie Snatchers is book three, and it's about someone changing all of the people, in, or the people, the chickens in town, into zombies. And book four, Heroes on the Side, is about uh, traveling, they travel to New York City. And there's a sidekick Supercon that he drop wants to go to. But it turns out that Tickly Beak and his bad eggs are behind everything, making all kinds of trouble. Ricky Ricotta's Mighty Robot by Dave Pilkey has been reissued with new artwork by Dan Santa. And this is book one. Ricky is a small mouse, and on the way to school each day, a couple of bullies pick on him. But Dr. Stinky McNasty has just created a mighty robot and orders that robot to destroy the town. The robot sees the frightened people and he refuses. Dr. McNasty shocks the robot and Ricky saves him by kicking a soccer ball at the doctor. Now he does have a friend. But Dr. McNasty was planning something more and Ricky and the robot have to face a giant lizard. There are, of course, several flipperama pages in each of these books. And the series goes on to include titles that involve creatures from all the different planets on our, in our solar system. So each new book is about one more planet. planet. And they're listed there on the list, but I didn't put them up here because we can't talk about every all series. of every series. Fiction for grades 2 to 5 or 6. Sidekicked by John David Anderson. The city of Jessica has several superheroes to deal with the villains that pop up occasionally, but one superhero, the Titan, hasn't been heard from since an epic battle six years ago. Now Drew, who's 13, has been teamed with him for sidekick training. Drew is one of a secret group of six middle school students with special abilities. His power, supervision, superhearing, and super smelling. He wishes he could shoot laser beams out of his eyes or something. A new supervillain has his, and his minions have arisen, and things are turning bad. It's full of action and humor, the juxtaposition of fighting evil and dealing with the usual middle school issues, and also his concern for his, um, 
his mentor Titan, see if he can get him out of out of his doldrums, I guess. A companion book to Sidekicks is Minion, also by John David Anderson. Michael is 13 or 14, he's not sure. He was adopted, quote unquote, at age nine. He can convince people to do what he wants if he looks them in the eye. His father does care for him, but also uses him to rob banks to fund his experiments. And his father's little boxes are purchased by the neighborhood mob boss. Michael thinks he must be a bad guy because of the things he does. But maybe he isn't, though. It's a good look at what makes a person bad, and that there is very little that is actually black and white. And I don't know if he's planning another companion book or not, but I'd be interested if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, I had to, I had to include an Oregon Yoda book, oh, Princess Label yeah. Maker to the Rescue. I mean, it's to the rescue. <laughs> not that even, huh? These are by Tom Engelberger. This continues the student's battle against fun time, the obnoxious video that is supposed to help them learn and be ready for tests, but which is so lame it turns the students off from learning. The group of friends working on this are surprised to find that at least some of the teachers also find it less than helpful. There, now, this book includes directions for folding Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker. This is the book five, book six, and the final book of the series is out now. It's mm -hmm. Emperor Pickle Time Rides the Bus. Mm -hmm. I have a copy, but I haven't read it yet. Joshua Dread by Lee Bacon. Joshua is in the sixth grade, and he and his parents have moved around often in order to hide the fact that they are supervillains, the dread duo. Sophie, the new girl, is the daughter of superhero Captain Justice. Then Joshua becomes gifted with a Y, with the power of spontaneous combustion, and must use it to rescue his parents from an even worse evil than they are. Book two is The Nameless Hero. Joshua is looking forward to a lazy, peaceful summer when he is invited to attend gifted and talented camp to learn more about developing and controlling his special skills. Once there, he finds things are a bit different than he expected. Book three is titled The Domino, The Domin, I'm sorry, The Dominion Key by Lee Bacon. And I haven't gotten a hold of a copy, mm -hmm. too, so sorry, but you can look for it if you need one. Smash, Trial by Fire by Chris A. Bolton. This says right up there in the corner, book one. I like it when I know what's going You know there'll be more coming. Yes, yes they're planning. Andrew Ryan is in fifth grade, and he idolizes superhero, the Defender. One day, Andrew is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Evil Doer the Magnus has devised a machine to steal all of the Defender's powers. But in the middle of the event, there is an explosion, and Andrew ends up with the powers. He has a limited time to learn how to use these powers and go to school and clean his room before the mag maggots comes for him. This full-color graphic novel is labeled Book One, so you know there'll be more, and it's it's, it's wonderful. If you like having hardcover graphic novels for younger readers, mm -hmm. get this one. Flora and Ulysses by Kate DiCamillo. After a squirrel is run over by a runaway vacuum, Flora, a self-described natural-born cynic, applies CPR and revives him. Naming him Ulysses, they are inseparable, while her mother is working behind the scenes to try and get rid of the squirrel. Her parents have separated, and Flora survives by reading the comic book she loves about the amazing incandesto, which includes terrible things can happen to you. She has studied every single issue so she can be ready for everything. Ulysses finds he can type and write poetry, and he can be a hero when needed. It's quirky and great fun, and many of you also know that Quinta Camillo has partnered with the Calabria Summer Library Program this summer and has created a, a, a four page, I think it is, comic book of the great Incandesto. Oh, nice. Along with some sections in the back about summer reading and, and, and keeping your reading up. Mm -hmm. And you can download that from the Collaborative Summer Library Program website, which I should have planned ahead of time to show you. But it's just CSLP Reads, R E A D S dot org. Probably org. org. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was just looking because I'll add that to the links for the oh, show great. notes afterwards. Too. And then you yeah. can find the, the, and you can download it and give it to people. They're encouraging for this summer. You can uh, down print it and hand it out as much as you like. Winter Sky by Patricia Riley Giff. Syria is almost 12 and she worries about her father. He's a firefighter. So she rides her bike in the night to find 
where he's fighting a fire and make sure that he's all right. He, he doesn't know this. Her best friend Douglas always goes with her, but soon she realizes someone in the neighborhood is starting fires, and she thinks she knows who it is. Her determination to solve this mystery in order to save her father and other firefighters threatens her whole world. The Adventures of Bean Boy by Lisa Hardraker, Raider, Hark Raider. <laughs> Tucker learns about a contest to create a sidekick for the comic book hero H2O. If he can win the scholarship prize and give it to his mother, that will help her with being gone so much to either work or school all the time. He struggles to come up with a reasonable character falling behind in his own schoolwork. His best friend Noah supports him, and the least likable girl in school, Sam Zawicki, seems to have it in for him. Mm -hmm. Tucker cares for his younger brother and his willingness to look beyond Sam's bad temper show he is a good kid who happens to love comic books. And he does come up with a, a sidekick, and his sidekick is Bean Boy. And if you can see, those of you who can see the illustration can discover that you know what beans do to us. And this, mm -hmm. su this sidekick has super bean power, and that's how he <laughs> flies. Oh, and there's a sequel to it that I haven't read yet. Um, there's a sequel, and I didn't write it down. I'm so sorry. Darling, Mercy Dog of World War I by Allison Hart is part of the Dog Chronicle series. This is book one, and each book is about a different dog during a different time frame, so you don't have to read them in any order. Mm -hmm. A beloved family pet, Darling, is an unspecified breed of herding dog, and they donate her to the British Army for World War I. Told from the dog's point of view, she is trained to find wounded soldiers and lead rescue people to them. While Darling is not involved in the war itself until about halfway through the book, her training and her duty in the war, war will catch readers' interests. And this isn't all that long of a book, but it's very well put together. Oh, I love Zeta the Space Girl. Zeta the Space Girl by Ben Hatke. This is book one. It's a full-color graphic novel. When Zeta's friend is abducted by aliens, she jumps into the fray landing on a strange planet. She is determined and fearless in her quest to find her friend, because it's really her fault that he got grabbed. She becomes a hero along the way. She cares about all beings and brings a new attitude to the planet. There are great monsters, action, and heart. And you can see that while there are monsters, they're really not that scary. It's on the artwork. Book two is Legends of Zeta the Space Girl. Zeta is a bit weary of all her appearances for fans, but when an imprintotron robot takes on her persona and leaves with her manager, she is hard-pressed to get her life back. And what will happen when the fake Zeta faces the invasion that's coming to a distant planet? And the third and final book is The Return of Zeta the Space Girl. Zeta is being held captive on Dungeon World and forced to work with many other slaves seeking one particular rock that hides a crystal. Zeta's care and concern for all the captives appears to hold her back, but in the end, it brings the extra effort needed to overthrow the Benjamin Ward. Caring for others and working together is big in Zeta's opinion. How to Catch a Boggle by Catherine Jinks. We find Orphan Birdie, who's 10, in Victorian London, proud to be an apprentice to Alfred Bunce the Boggler. This life is much better than being a rag picker, which she was before. Her job now is to act as bait to lure the boggle, the boggle out for Alfred to catch and kill. Alfred lost one assistant to a boggle, and he's determined to never have that happen again. He is not the expected cool master. He worries for Bernie's safe, safety, but this is the only way he knows how to catch and dispose of the deadly boggles. Now something odd is about. Orphans are disappearing, and Alfred and Bernie may be in more danger than usual. This title has spookiness, concern for Bernie's well-being, the social divisions in London, and the concept of considering other options for catching and killing dangerous bottles. Book two came out recently, A Plague of Bottles. Bertie is living with Miss Ames and missing her freedom and her friends, knowing that she used to keep the world a bit safer. Now it seems the bottles are concentrating in a specific area of London, and Bertie is again needed to help. And book three is going to come out in the fall of this year, titled The Last Bottle. Togo by Kate Climo is part of the Dog Diaries series of books, similar to the other series I talked about, where each book stands on its own and is about a different dog. 
Told from Togo's point of view, this fictional look at an, at an historic event will bring an adventure and animal fan to read about the use of dog sleds in the past and a desperate trip to bring vaccine for diphtheria to know. Occasional black and white sketches add to the tale, and in the back of the book are a couple of photographs of the actual Togo and his owner, dog sledder, mm -hmm. and some information about them. I think most of those in this series do that. Many of you are familiar with Lunch Lady, and the, this is, I had to pull this, this is book two, but I had to pull this out because it's Lunch Lady and the League mm -hmm. of Librarians. Of course, we all have to have that book. Yes. <laughs> it's by Jared J. Gros, oh dear, Krosolska, sorry. The school is setting up for a book fair and readathon, and the librarian, Mrs. Page, is uncharacteristically grumpy. It turns out she is part of the League of Librarians seeking world domination. Their secret weapon? Books! They read the title and characters appear and attack. Oh, nice. Will Lunch Lady, Betty, and the three kids, Hector, Terrence, and Dee, be able to defeat them? This is silly fun with black and white and yellow graphic novel, and I think kids will love the idea of the Lunch Lady and her assistant, Betty, who work in the kitchen at the school. Their secret lair is underneath the kitchen. <laughs> and they have all these kinds of things that, that just looks like a spatula, but no, it's also a secret weapon. Just like James Bond. Exactly. His pen is a laser, whatever. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and they not only keep the school safe, but they go out and support bank robberies in the community, too. So there's Lunch Lady and the video game Villain, which is book nine. Book ten, I've been told this is the last book, but we're, mm -hmm. we're wondering if there might be another one. Mm -hmm. This is book ten, Lunch Lady and the School White Scuffle. Criminals are on the rampage. Lunch Lady and Betty cannot access their secret lair beneath the school cafeteria kitchen because they've been fired. The new superintendent, Dr. Van Grindheimer, is changing everything at the school. Could she behind, be behind it all? Now, the best thing about this book, as this potent, probably the series ending, I love the fact that the League of Librarians come back and help Lunch Lady save the day. So, see, we're not really bad. And wouldn't the world be a better place if we owned it? <laughs> so, um, the same author is the um, also written the Platypus Police Squad set of books. There's two so far, and he's the artist who did our our T-shirts for this coming summer. So I think you recognize Platypus. Yeah. Eye. Yeah. Is that Platypus? I I don't know. Platypus. <laughs> Platypus Police Squad: The Frog Who Croaked by Jared J. Kosowska. Enthusiastic looking Rick Zango joins the Platypus Police Squad and is partnered with veteran detective Corey O'Malley. Zango jumps in too soon several times and jeopardizes their investigation into illegal fish dealings. One main plot issue is solved, but the reader will find it goes deeper at the end of book two. And one of the things I like about this series is that they don't have guns, they use boomerangs as their defensive weapon and also to catch the bad guys. So book two of Platypus Police Squad is the Ostrich Conspiracy, where they're, they're, this takes place at the theme park you can see there on the roller coaster there. And they're still trying to solve the deeper mystery of who's behind these fish demons. Mm. And we have to recognize Captain Underpants, but this is great because this is a reissue of the original book. The only thing that's changed is it is now in full color. Oh, yeah. So The Adventures of Captain Underpants by Dave Pilkey. It has the exact same text. Well, I didn't sit and look at it word for word, but it pretty much seemed the same. <laughs> the idea is, yeah. And it also, uh, of course, has the flipperama, and it has two pages of fun facts at the back of the book. And also it has a 13-page The Origin of Captain Underpants at the back of the book. So if you need to replace yours, here's your opportunity. Mm -hmm. Nickel Bay Net by Dean Pitchford. The townspeople of Nickel Bay are still in the middle of hard times ever since the factory closed. One bright spot is that every Christmas, Nickel Bay Nick leaves $100 bills around town to give hope to the people. Sam, who's 11, had a heart transplant at the age of four, and that is also when his mom left his father. Sam runs around with a couple of ne'er-do-wells, shoplifting and things like that. But but this time, Sam accidentally damaged their neighbor's house, and he has to work to pay off the debt. That's when he finds out that he, Sam, will stand in for Nickel Bay Nick this year. It realistically portrays Sam's anger and his acting out, and his growing respect for his neighbor, his father, and himself. 
And what a good feeling to, to help people who are on, in the middle of hard times. Oh, I love Fame Bone. Fame Bone by Michael Rex. This is book one. Evil warlord Dread Venomous Drool is reassembling his body in order to take over the world in another dimension. Because they had, before this book starts, they had the people, the barbarians had hacked him all apart mm -hmm. and spread him across different dimensions. Fame That's Bone, the only way to do it. Well, yeah, you kind of not let him reassemble. Fame Bone is not considered old enough to be a warrior, so his clan charges him with taking Drool's big toe to the sorcerer, who will send it and Fame Bone to a different dimension. Landing in the town dump, he befriends Bill, Bill, a victim of Bully Duncan. Now, Fangbone must attend third grade while being on alert for any sign of Drool. This is a graphic novel in orange, black, and white, and kids will love the fact that um, Billy, Bill has to teach Fangbone how to do things like use the toilet. Because Fangbone's never had yeah, that one. Yeah. Don't do that. And, you know, I'm not going to argue with Big Boat about much, but he's actually, he's a very good friend. He really does like Bill. Book two is The Egg of Misery. Thang Bone has sent an egg he must hatch and protect while it goes to help him guard the big toe, toe of cruel. But some deception happened along the way, and actually it's going to hatch out into a monster that's supposed to take care of Thang Bone. And book three is The Birthday Party of Dread. The evil Lord Drew is sending the Crusher after Fangbone in order to regain his big toe. But his friend Bill accidentally received the mark intended to show the monster his prey. Now Bill is the one that the monster is going to attack. I think kids just love the idea. Oh, he, when he goes to school, they, they don't comment really on his outfit because um, they tell him, they tell the teachers that it's his native costume. He's, a, he's an exchange mm -hmm. student from somewhere. So you can't like, argue with that. And you no. can't really, you know, you're trying to be all in, uh, inclusive while well, you don't want to argue about what he's wearing in school. Little Green Men at the Mercury Inn by Greg Lutich Smith. Aiden is 12 and he helps his parents with their motel in Florida. They draw quite a few visitors when NASA launches and hold long, launching parties to celebrate. Aiden's best friend Lula stops by to help too. But Aiden soon moves, <laughs> soon learns that at least one outer space alien is hiding at the motel, and he decides to help him or her to get home again. Mm -hmm. The Case of the Time Capsule Bandit is book one in the Brand New Rose Ninja Detective series by Octavia Spencer. Mm -hmm. Following the death of her mother, Randy, who was 12, and her father moved from Brooklyn to a small town in Tennessee. Randy is a black belt in Taekwondo, and she was also a vigilante detective in Brooklyn. Now she has new mystery to solve and a new friend to help her. They must solve who stole the town's time capsule and why. Randy is a good friend and inspires like behavior from her new acquaintances in Deer Creek. It's well written with some occasional illustrations and some ninja tasks for the readers to try out at the back of the book. And book two came out at the end of March. It's called, titled the sweetest heist in history, and I haven't read that yet. Dinos, Dinos Are Forever is book one in the Adventures of Joe Schmo series by Greg Trine. Joe is in fourth grade, and she receives a cape in the mail and learns that she has now inherited her family's heritage of fighting crime. It's all in the cape, but she needs to learn how to use it. Dr. Dastardly has perfected his reanimator laminator, and now he is in control of dinosaur skeletons who will help him take over the city. Humorous and silly, Joe and her sidekick Raymond the dog are ready for anything. She's cut off a little, you see how long her cape is, it's too long. So she cuts off the end of it and she makes it a cape for her sidekick Raymond the dog. And he gets, he gets powers too then. Well, he can run really fast in a circle and make holes in the ground. <laughs> and that could be helpful in some situations. So yeah. Yeah. There are four other titles so far in this series and I haven't read any of the other ones, but again, I do know that in um, Shifty Business, Jo begins to discover that she can change her appearance somewhat, so that's what she looks like. Mm -hmm. She looks kind of like Frankenstein, the green, and the difference on the cover. Nonfictions for grades two to five or six or so starts with Stubby the War Dog by Ann Bowscombe. Stubby is a mixed bulldog stray, and he connected with J. Robert Conroy while they were on a uh, football field doing practice and getting ready to be shipped over to World War I. They smuggle the dog on board. He's not supposed to go. 
But Stubby was more than a companion. He warned the, the soldiers of gas and imminent attack. He killed rats in the trenches. And he also captured a German soldier all by himself. This true story tells of the war, some of the men who fought it, and one dog who didn't stay home. It's illustrated with numerous photos from the time, and for those of you who might be worry worrying, both J. Robert Conroy and Stubby make it back from the war. Sniffer Dogs by Nancy F. Castaldo describes a variety of duties sniffer dogs may be trained to perform, such as finding explosives, drugs, lost people, detection of medical issues, to name a few. There are lots of color photo and photos used to make this an appealing and informative book. The Big Book of Superheroes by Bart King is along the lines of the dangerous book for boys, etc. Um, and one of the first things you'll find in this book is a disclaimer saying that the author is not responsible for any in in injury or anything <laughs> due to the book. So I'm not so much recommending that well, you can put it out on the shelf if you want to, but take a look through it first. And I really think this would be a great resource for the, the librarian to use for their summer program if you're going to have a section on superheroes. Because uh, there's, there are things like, uh, on page 152 to 153, there's lists for kids to create their own superhero name yeah. and things like that. So there's lots of different How activities yes, if you're not really feeling comfortable putting it on your shelf. <laughs> Bill the Wonder Boy by Mark Tyler Nobleman. Bill Finger helped Bob King create the comic book character Batman, but this fact was kept secret for many years. Brief explanations of how things were usually done at that time help readers understand how Bill could have been left off the credits. It includes large comic book format illustrations and occasional plays on words using Bill's last name of Finger. It also includes a four-page author's note at the back of the book giving more details about Batman, Paul, and Bill. And Mark Tyler Nobleman has also written Boys of Steel, a picture book biography of two teens. Jerry Siegel loved reading comic books and wrote them instead of being outside with other teens. And Joe Schuster, his friend, also loved comic books and drew pictures every chance he had. They tried to get their stories published but were not successful until Jerry had a new idea about someone from another planet who has superpowers on Earth, and they created Superman. The three page afterward tells more of Jerry and Joe's struggles with DC Comics, because after they created Superman, they sold all rights to him mm -hmm. to a company. And as the book explained, this happened a lot, and that was kind of the, the way things went at that time. Yeah. Unmasked, which is the teen theme for this upcoming summer, we have some fiction for younger readers. How am I doing? Oh, I'm terrible. I'm way along. I'm way yeah. Along. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We started late. Yeah, we just started about five minutes late. This is true. Oh, that's fine. Um, yeah, yeah, and we're just at 11 o'clock. Those of you still um, holding out this at time, we're going to keep going until Sally gets through her whole list. So if you do have to leave, that's fine. Um, go ahead. We're recording until the end, and you can come back and watch what you missed later. Okay. Dangerous by Shannon Hale. Maisie Brown is lucky to go to astronaut camp thanks to her knowledge of math. She is missing her right hand, but functions just fine with her artificial one. While at camp, she and four others are exposed to alien materials, which end up being absorbed by their bodies. <clears throat> they begin to develop superpowers and learn that they could be the only defense against an alien invasion. But some of her companions are not handling the change as well. And I really expect there's going to be another book. If you're sick of dystopia, <laughs> Buy this book. <laughs> the Summer I Saved the World in 65 Days by Michelle Weber Hurwitz. Nina is 13 and it's the summer before her freshman year in high school. <clears throat> she is inspired kind of by accident to try an experiment. She noticed her neighbor lady who always had annuals out in her front yard. She act, her neighbor had broken her leg and she was sitting out there looking at these little pots of plants ready to be planted on her stool with her legs sticking out and she's all sad and she decides and she has to go back in the house. So Nina decides she'll plant the flowers for her. Sneakily at night she plants the flowers. And the lady's so happy. So she decides to perform one act of kindness a day, usually secretly, and see if it has any effect on her neighborhood. This is an upbeat book and though Nina faces a few problems, it is a positive. So you might want to add that to your collection. The Story of Owen, Dragon Slayer of Trondheim by E.K. Johnson. In an alternate Canada, 
older Nebian that dragons exist and will eat people, Shoban, 16, happened to be in the hall when new student Owen, also in 11th grade, was trying to find his English class. class. Shaban sees people as parts of musical scores, whether opera, symphony, or pop music. Owen is training in the family business of dragon slaying. Soon it is decided that Shaban will be Owen's bard, and this means attending training and dragon slaying. And there's a second book that just came out, and I haven't seen that one yet. Constable and Toot by Gareth P. Jones. In Victoria, London, Sam Toot, 14, can speak to ghosts and sometimes help them helps them, though he tries not to let anyone know of his ability. <clears throat> his father is part owner of the Constable and Truth Funeral Parlor, and Sam helps her there every day. When the ghost clerk Lapswood is sent into the real world to find a missing ghost worker, he learns the black rot, a horrible substance that sucks in and imprisons ghosts, is spreading in London, but no one listens. There's lots of going on, and readers will be fascinating. It's a bit gruesome at times, especially with Sam's no-good Uncle Jack. Geeks, Girls, and Secret Identities by Mike Jung. Vincent and his two best friends live in Copper Plate City, the home of Captain Stupendous, the best superhero in the world. The three friends have studied everything they could about Captain S, including his most often used battling techniques. When Polly, Vincent's crush, receives Captain S's powers as the prior recipient is dying, the threesome offers to teach her all she needs to know to be successful, just in time to face the mad scientist, Professor Mayhem. Dogs of War by Sheila Keenan. This contains three separate stories in graphic novel format, each about a dog who helped his companion in wartime. Boots located wounded soldiers in World War I. Loki did more than lead the dog sled team in Greenland, bringing down some Nazis in World War II. Shiva sniffed out the Viet Cong before the U.S. troops were spotted as part of the scout dog patrol in Vietnam. The Cloak Society by Jeremy Krantz. Alex Knight, 12, a junior member of the Cloak Society, evil, is ready for his first encounter with the Rangers of Justice who are good. But during the battle, Alex instinctively saves the life of the junior member of the Rangers. He is stunned by his behavior and wonders how it happened. He's a bad guy. What is he doing in helping anybody. His best friend Gabe is a tech genius inventing lots of high-tech tools for supervillains until he joins with Alex to work for good against all they have ever known. That's the end of book one. Book two is Villains Rising. The big battle at the end of book one left all the adult rangers of justice lost in the gloom of an alternate universe. The junior, the junior members of the Cloak Society and the rangers have come together forming a kind of tentative partnership to try and rescue the, the adult rangers and overcome both. In book three, Fall of Heroes, Alex and the other former junior rangers and cult members succeed in rescuing Lone Star and Lux from the gloom, but they, though they've been rescued, they currently have no superpowers. They think it will take them days or weeks to, to regain their powers. A final showdown with the cult society will determine the fate of the cities Lots of action again to keep readers reading. Chris Lynch has started another series. This is the World War II series. The first book is The Right Fight. Roman Busek, pro ball, ball player in the Eastern Shore Baseball League, enlists in the U.S. Army and becomes part of a tank team fighting the Nazis in Africa. The Army's fight is told from Roman's point of view, conveying the waiting along with the flurry of action. His letters home to his fiance are included as well. <clears throat> Book two is Dead in the Water. Hank McCallum joins the Navy just prior to Pearl Harbor, and his younger brother is going to join the Army Air Corps. The book follows Hank, assigned as an Airedale, working to prep and move planes on the USS Yorktown. While waiting for the planes to return, he takes out his gloves and baseball to pay, play catch with anyone willing to step in. Most often, a former Negro Leagues player, Bradford, steps up to join him, and he learns a bit about the unfair treatment of African Americans in the service. Letters to and from his family are included, and it ends with a cliffhanger, just many of us know what happened to the, to the Yorktown during the war. It was sunk. Book three, Alive and Kicking, the old brother of Hank, is a gunner on a B-24 Liberator, a bomber plane stationed in England. 
Hank has been reported as missing, and Theo is certain he is alive. Theo and his planes crew go on bombing runs, return fire at the fighters' planes attacking them, and do their best to complete their missions and return to England. Not all planes make it back. And I understand there's going to be one more book in this series. Cat Girl's Day Off by Kimberly Pauly. Natalie Nung keeps her talent a secret so she won't be called Cat Girl. Her two sisters have Class A or B talents, super achievers while she has a Class D talent, the ability to talk with cats. But when Nat and her friends are watching a video about the teen stars filming a new version of Paris Bueller, it includes a spot with Easton West, a famous celebrity gossip columnist, and her cat. And the cat yells out that that lady is not her owner. And only Natalie, of course, can understand her. Soon the three are enmeshed in a mystery, trying to find the real Easton and capture the fake. It's funny, dangerous, and empathetic. And I can't remember why the cat is pink, <laughs> but that happens. Read the book to find out. But yeah. Battling Boy by Paul Pope. This is a full-color graphic novel. The son of a hero, the boy, 12, must follow the tradition, take up his cloak, and go rambling. He ends up on an unknown planet and must fight monsters that threaten the city of Acropolis. He slowly discovers his powers. The t-shirt he wears gives him the power of the animal pictured on it. Connected with that, the Battling Boy book are, are the Aurora West series. The first book is called The Rise of Aurora, Aurora West, also by Paul Pope and J.T. Petty. I'm not sure when book two will come out. Aurora has been training with her father, science hero Haggard West. She encounters a clue to her mother's long ago murder and follows it to discover and remember some things about her family's past that are unsettling. Black and white art in a smaller than usual graphic novel as they do go out and fight bad guys and help people in the, in the town. The St Screaming Staircase by Jonathan Stroud is Lockwood and Company, Book One. In an alternate London, malevolent ghosts have been increasing in number and only children and teens can see or hear them and force them to move on. It is dangerous work. After a bad experience, Lucy has left the countryside and joined Anthony Lockwood's new agency in London. They are given an extremely dangerous assignment that kills three operatives from another company. Solving the case and dispersing the ghost may be more than anyone can do. Creepy and scary includes humor and adventure with well-written main characters. And I forgot to mention that I am not a reader of scary things like this. But I could get through this one even though it was scary. <laughs> it was, I made it. So book two, The Whispering Skull, is as creepy as the first book. So when I tell you it's creepy, you might say, oh, yeah, sure. That's okay. Sometimes the, you got to try and get out of your comfort zone. That's right. A little. <laughs> the three teens who comprise Lockwood and Company are now attempting to find the most foul item, a mirror, which has killed several people so far. The spirit of the skull in the jar has begun to talk to Lucy, and she must continue to remind herself that it is evil and a liar. Will it help or hurt their investigation? And there's, I think there's going to be at least one more book in this series. The Shadow Hero by Jean Lin Yang. Yang has reimagined and recreated a superhero who was first on the scene in the 1940s. The Green Turtle was probably the first Asian American superhero, as explained in the back of the book. And a sample of the original comic book is also included at the back of the book. Yang gives the Green Turtle an origin story, and we meet Hank Chu, 19, who initially resists his mother's urgings to become a superhero, but following a tragedy, over time, becomes the green turtle. It is some color in the art, but mostly it's muted blues. Nonfiction for teens. March Book One by John Lewis and Andrew Aiden has black and white art, and it's a graphic novel or graphic memoir format for John Lewis and his experiences during the Civil Rights Movement. It's very powerful. And March book two has just come out, but I haven't gotten a hold of a copy yet. And I believe there's going to be three books all together mm -hmm. in this series. Navy Seal Dogs by Mike Ridland has been adapted for younger readers from his book written for adults titled Trident Canine Warriors. This tells some of his experiences as a Navy Seal, but more about how he now trains dogs to accompany Navy Seal's teams. Fiction for older teens. Killer of Enemies by Joseph Bouchard. Part Chirakawa Apache, Lozen, 17, 
is skilled in curing, killing the giant genetically engineered monsters that roam the countryside. She has extrasensory gifts similar to her warrior woman ancestor and also carries her name. Now that the cloud has caused most machinery to quit, the world is a different place. Her mother, brother, and sister are being held by the four heads of Haven, the former prison now being used to keep the monsters out and the slaves in. The Blosen can continue to survive. She plans to eventually free her family. The Reluctant Assassin by Owen Colfer is the first book in the series Warp. 17-year-old Chevron Savano, an FBI agent, is in London babysitting a time travel pod that hasn't seen action in 10 years when everything goes crazy. Riley, 14, arrives with a dead scientist who was hiding in Victorian London in 1898. Riley is certain that Eric, a killer for hire who basically owns him, will be arriving at any moment, even though the time travel pod has disintegrated. And he's right. Gary shows up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Book two, The Hangman's Revolution. Chevy finds her modern world a completely different place from what it was like when she left it. She inhabits the Chevy from this reality, continually getting her in trouble with her unusual remarks. After the two Chevys return to 1899 and find Riley, the Chevy we met in book one is in control, and she realizes action is, action is needed to prevent the future she saw. Lots of action, well-developed main characters, and the philosophy of why we should not time travel, along with the awful state of London in 1899, stink, disease, crime, and more are included. And there's going to be at least one more book, I'm not sure there will be more than that. If you love The Wizard of Oz, do not read this book. <laughs> because Dorothy Must Die mm -hmm. by Danielle Page. Amy Gum has traveled from Kansas to Oz via tornado. There she learned that Dorothy had returned. After she went home, she came back to Oz. She's become a nasty, selfish ruler, and she must die. Recruited by the Revolutionary Order of the Wicked, Amy is trained and then sent to work in the palace as a maid, waiting for her chance to do in Dorothy. Um, the second book just came out at the end of March. It's titled The Wicked Will Rise. I just received a review copy. I haven't started on it yet. Thanks. So I don't know if it's just going to be two books or going to be more. Mm. Steelheart by Brandon Sanderson is the book, first book in the Reckoner series. In a world where superpowered humans are not heroes but are dictators and bullies, David, now 18, at age 10, saw his father killed by Steelheart, the powerful ruler of Nukago. David has spent his time learning all he can about the ethics, what regular humans call the superpowered beings. Now he has a chance to join the Reckoners, regular humans who are fighting back, and he's sure he can get Steelheart. Book two came out just this January, I think. Um, Babylon Restored, which is formerly Manhattan, the reigning epic is Regalia, and one of her subordinate epics is Firefight. David and the Reckoners travel to Babylon to take them down. And book three will come out uh, later this year, I think. And maybe there will be more. I'm not sure if it will just be three. And yay! There are some other books later on, on your, further down on your list that are just new books and series that would work for summer, but I didn't want to take mm -hmm. any more time today. So thank you so much for listening, yeah, and I hope you find some titles you can, you can use. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much, Sally, and everyone who stuck around. Quite a few people on. Great. And we all went like 10 minutes over uh, okay. from when we started, so not a problem at all. Do we have any um, questions? Or? Yeah, if anybody does have any questions, go ahead and type them in. Nobody said anything during the show. So um, I'm just listening very intently, I'm sure. Um, I know I say this every time you do this show session and your um, Best Youth Books one at the end of the year, that I get a lot of ideas for, um, I know this is for the summer reading program, but I get ideas for books to buy for um, kids that I know, friends, kids, relatives, right, kids, yes. and whatnot. So I'm always taking notes and keeping track of it for who, you know, which ones would be good for good. birthdays coming up for some children that I know and whatnot. So. <laughs> All of these are great books. Yeah. All right, it doesn't look like anything urgent is coming in. That's fine. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, the show um, is being recorded and will be available later today, potentially. Um, depends on how long it takes to get everything processed. So that will wrap it up for today's Encompass Live. And over here I do have, here is our website. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's Encompass Live. Um, when the recording is available, it will be posted on our site here, and right below our upcoming shows is the link 
to our archived Encompass Live sessions. And when you click there, you get the list of all of our shows. Um, the PowerPoint slides will be here as well. Um, you can see here from last week's, we put up the recording onto our YouTube account. The slides will be here via our slide share. Um, links to any of our sessions, and we'll also put a link to the, hand, uh, we'll link to the handouts page where the actual, um, the whole sheet is, so you can have your own copy of that um, for your reference um, later. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is actually a webinar about webinars, we'll say. Um, what we've learned, tips and tricks for webinars that deliver the goods. Oh, great idea. Um, yeah, this will be myself, Michael Sowers, and Laura Johnson um, here from the Library Commission. Um, we've been doing Encompass Live, as I said, since January 2009. So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, yeah, six years. We're in our... Yeah, I'm in our seventh. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're in our seventh year. Um, and we've attended lots of webinars and we presented lots. And so we're going to put together a session on um, how to do it right, how to do it well, um, be prepared, and things that would potentially occur and happen to you during your show that you might want to um, be aware of. So hopefully you can um, you know, sign up for that next week with us. And any of our other shows you see we have here on the calendar for the next couple of months, they're there. Also, if you are a Facebook user, Encompass Live is also on Facebook, so do please go ahead and pop over there and like our Facebook page. We post, as you can see here, any reminders every Wednesday to log in for people who didn't pre-register. People can log in on the fly. I announce when our recordings are available, so you can help keep up to speed on what's going on with the show on Facebook if you are a big Facebook user. Other than that, we are good to go. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, we'll see you next time in Encompass Live. Bye-bye.